Lifting in the cage is unlike any other experience. It's, you, you can't describe it. People ask all the time, you know, they ask on the forums and they want these quotes about what it's like lifting in the cage. You just can't explain it. You have to experience it. Definitely has a hardcore feel to it when you go to the cage. It's kind of like you don't see girls there handing out little samples of stuff in their bikinis. You see just big guys throwing around weight. The cage is, is an opportunity for the, the fans to interact with, you know, some of the best bodybuilders and powerlifters that the sport has to offer. One of the great things about the cage is that there's a lot of spectacle to it. There's, you know, some of the greatest lifters in the world, these world-class powerlifters uh, and strongmen putting on these exhibitions that are, you know, mind-blowing in that even to most of us who are so dedicated to this lifestyle, we still can't even relate to, to weights on that level. Un unreal, something I'll never forget. Just an amazing experience. The energy, the crowd you feed off of, it's just insane. So that's where the, the freakiest of the freaky go, the, the baddest of the bad. There's nothing else like it. Everybody gets behind each other, from professional athletes to your average Joes from the forum, your weekend warriors that come together and, and enjoy the brand and then enjoy the atmosphere. To the, the fan, they're gonna be wild no matter what, but to someone who's really looking at it, it's still equally impressive. These guys are just literal animals. I have, I have wanted to squat in the cage for about probably about four years, as long as I've been a power lifter. Um, I've seen videos of it on YouTube, and the impression that I got is that that's just where the best of the best and the freakiest of the freaky go. And I said, even back then, about three or four years ago, that I'm going to squat in the cage someday. These are all the top guys, literally. They're there, and they're all doing what they do and doing it very well. The cage, you know, this is, that's where we all come together every year. Some of us are getting ready for shows, some of us are in our off season. It's like coming home for Christmas kind of thing, you know, with your family. The cage is probably one of the biggest attractions at the Arnold Classic. Um, it's definitely a booth that sets, sets itself apart from everything else. When you first come into the Arnold Classic, you'll see the, the big animal banners hanging. Uh, I've always noticed that. The cage definitely, with the fencing, separates it from any of the other the booths. You know, when you look at a lot of the other booths and you see lines, you know, people lined up, and maybe you got a guy there sitting there signing stuff. By, by the very nature of it, you got a whole line of people. So someone steps up, you got to sign the thing for them, give it to them, and send them on their way. And it's kind of has a very impersonal feel to it. You know, it's kind of like, okay, get in line, next. Every fan, everybody comes up to me, I, I take time to take a picture or sign something, or do you just even talk for five minutes. The fans make us who we are. And um, I think it's pretty, you know, amazing that even there's one person out there would want you to shake your hand to say, you know, you look great or, uh, great job what you did. We kind of take a realistic approach to the sport in a certain way. 99.5% of the population, Mr. Olympia could walk past him in the supermarket. They would have no idea who he was. When we're out here at the Arnold, that's flipped on its head. And there is a cult of celebrity involved in our industry to a certain extent, where all these people here are so into the sport, who are insiders, see these guys who are in the magazines or whatever, and they're kind of put on a pedestal where you know, some guys are whisked in with security. There's lines for their autographs that wrap around, you know, their booth and down the aisle. There's, there's something kind of presumptuous and standoffish about that sort of thing, you know, like Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Elvis, those are celebrities, right? Like, we're just guys who lift weights. When you walk into the cage and you hear Vinnie Galani's voice, over the mic, it's, it's just literally, it, it's chills down my spine. Like I said, I've been to a lot of cage events over the last couple of years, and that's something that never goes away. You're always nervous, you're always anxious as you're walking into the expo center, and you see the, the animal banners hanging over the middle of the expo. And, and the closer you get, the louder the music gets. And 
and it's unreal. And then you get inside and you see the same familiar faces that you saw for the last two or three years, brothers that you've met through AnimalPack.com, professional athletes that you see in animal ads, all coming together to support a brand that's brought everyone together. A lot of companies sign and drop athletes every, you know, every other year, every couple months. With Animal, it's been, it's been the same guys for the last four or five years. As long as I've been around, it's for the most part been the same group of guys. And it really makes it easy to get behind each other and have a camaraderie. And like yesterday, you know, Richard Hawthorne deadlifted 620 at a body weight of around 130 pounds. And Garrett, who's a new Animal athlete, I was joking around with him and I said, you know how Richard got started with Animal. And uh, he said, no. I said, well, we were having a pros versus bros event and there was 500 pounds on the bar and they were deadlifting. And Richard was just standing in the cage watching. Nobody really knew who he was. And he said, I can do that. And a couple of us just kind of looked at him. We were like, okay. And he was like, no, I can do that. I want to try. We're like, all right, okay, give it a try. And he pulled it 10 times and earned 30 pounds. And I mean, it was insane. To see him, you know, walk in the cage and, and nobody really knew who he was and do something so crazy. And then over the course of the last two or three years, he has his own, his own event that is so hyped and there's so many people just standing 10 and, 10 and 15 people deep in the aisles just to watch him deadlift. To be able to stand behind him and cheer him on and get him pumped up and rack and unrack his weights. Things like that are just crazy. Last year, uh, me and P. Diesel had a 500 pound deadlift for reps, and uh, it was a good battle, it was close. Uh, 17 reps I got, uh, Patrick got 14. We, uh, we got a request to get a rematch again this year, and P and I decided, hey, let's up the ante. Let's let's go up to, don't do 500 pounds. Let's do 525 pounds. I've said this a bunch of times, and you hear more and more from all these athletes that the cage is 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 like essentially the Super Bowl of lifting. It's um, it's more hype, it's more live than any other competition you'll ever go to. Having competed all over the place in strongman myself, a little bit of powerlifting here and there, it's just nothing compares to the cage as live as as hype as it is. With all these people around you, literally right on top of you, it's kind of hard to slow yourself down sometimes because it's so it's so exciting. Well, you know, like last year uh, I went first, and so this year P went first. So when I saw what I had to shoot for, I know in training I was able to get 13, but. I didn't max out more than 13 because I wanted to save it for the cage. My goal was actually 16 reps. Up next from the West Coast, Ego Monster. Last year, 17 reps with 500. He raised the stakes this year, 525. Will he retain his title? Or does Pete Diesel become the new deadlift champion? Let's go, Higa. Now, I'll tell you what, when, when you see the crowd, and you see a guy like Ed Cohen in front of you judging your reps. Knowing the things that he's done. Yeah. Knowing that he, he expected from himself, and he probably expects from you. Yeah, time to turn it up. Feeling. 
I can say all kinds of things about it. I, I went over again, again, again in my head. There's about 10 things I did wrong. I didn't show up. And Grant, in his experience, I can't beat the experience that Grant has. He's, he's a fantastic lifter. He's strong as hell. He's versatile as hell. His endurance is through the roof. I, I'm blown away by this guy. I really am. I really am. And, and the things that I didn't do well and I lost the rep, Grant did perfect. His first rep and his 18th rep were exactly the same. And that's where he that's where he capitalized, that's where I did not. It's a privilege to deadlift against him, and I won't say this any other time, and I'll probably never say it again. It's a privilege, it's a privilege to deadlift against him. Um, I'm thrilled that we could do it again, and it's something I'll think about. You know, I've never been handed an ass whooping like that in my whole life, and you'd be damn sure I ain't never having one again. West Coast? Yeah, West, West Coast. Coast? He can have that for now. He can have that for now. It's not complicated. A lot of people try to think uh, training arms is complicated. It's really not. Um, I keep it pretty simple. Yeah, everybody wants to be jacked. Everybody wants to be strong. Everybody wants the ladies pulling on their shirt as they go by, right? What they don't realize is that what goes into that, even those guys on that elite level, is, you know, just rigorous training every day, all the time. When you, when you look at yourself and you say, okay, well, I look like this, but I can be better. I can, I can, there can be more. I can do more. That in itself, to me, is motivating. I mean, if I knew right now, okay, you're the best you're ever going to be. You will never accomplish anything more. You will never be better than you are right now. I mean, that's like a, that's like a death sentence, you know, at least to a bodybuilder, at least to me. It's almost imperceptible. It's imperceivable what you do from day to day as far as how much you're progressing. You can't look in the mirror, you can't train one day, look in the mirror the next day and be like, oh my God, you know, I, my physique is completely different now or I'm so much stronger now. So it's, you almost don't notice from day to day the progress you're making. But in that consistency over time, it starts to add up. And that consistency starts to add up. And, you know, days become weeks, weeks become months, months become years. And over that time, you're progressing and it starts to really add up. And these small things, these small things that seem to be so little, so meaningless day to day over time really add up to something, something great. That lesson that the weights teaches relates to every aspect of our lives. The no-handed squat. I get asked that question all the time and whether or not that's a, a useful training tool and how often I do it. It's not a training tool. I uh, was flipping through the internet one day watching YouTube videos and I saw a, a picture of, or a, a video of Misha uh, Kuklaev, the uh, Russian strongman, who's, I think, is probably the, the best strength athlete of all time. And I came across this video of him one day giving a strength exhibition. He did a, something crazy like a 400 pound snatch and a 500 pound clean and jerk and then just decided he's going to do a squat and he, he backs it out. It's, I think it was 660 pounds and he walks it out and you think he's going to squat. Next thing you know, he lets go of the bar. And I was like, what is this guy doing? He puts his hands out and he squats down and just flies up off his back and throws the bar off his back and got a big smile on his face and the crowd roars and I was like, wow, that's, that's impressive. And uh, I thought that'd be, that'd be great to try at the Arnold. You think back to some of the old time strong men, the circus dumbbells that they used to lift and Paul Anderson with the the hip lift and some of the strange stuff that he used to do. And sometimes it's just cool to see a circus trick. I figured I was either gonna put on a big show and give a big number and everybody's gonna enjoy it or I was gonna get hurt and that's always kind of fun to watch too. So, <laughs> you know, I figured what the hell, I'll give it a shot. Here we go.
started training them uh, probably close to 15 years ago and they were a lot younger and kind of just took to it and here they are. It's, it's, it's not like we're new to this, just uh, new to being recognized, I would say. Been competing for a long time, a lot of years, a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of injuries. Um, it's just been a, a real, real fun ride. And now they're at the top of the game. It, you just know how hard they try. Yeah. And, and Ernie, too, he fought through that, that 800 pound squat today. It was a grinder and he put it right up. Yeah. You just keep pushing. You, yeah. you never give no, up. Quit. Never. Not at all. Let's get behind it. 800 pounds. Lacey, let's go. Here we go. I didn't see it happen. I came up and squat right after him. I grabbed the bar and I looked down and there's blood all over the floor. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> and then I come back, it's all over your shirt. Yeah, and that's, those things happen. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, starting from, I guess, uh, last November for Eric and Stan going head to head <laughs> in the uh, pursuit of the uh, number one spot at the 275 class. Come on, Stan. It was also a, a battle for first to squat 900. And um, that's pretty much what this was. So this is just uh, a little bit further of that saga as it's unfolding. This was, I guess, round two, maybe. The first one to get in a meet, obviously, is where it will count, uh, and they're obviously both more than ready for this. This was just uh, a little proof to show everyone that it's it's time, it's going to happen. This is definitely going to happen. Yeah, I was just telling Eric downstairs that two weeks ago he hit an 875 in practice, and there was a sticking point in the middle. He, he, he powered through it and hit it pretty solid. You watch this one, there's no sticking point. From bottom to top, he went all the way up. And what's even more special about that is that uh, what you'll notice in the video, if you watch closely, is the whip in that bar was extraordinary, and that's, that's atypical. In a meet, usually you're using a, a bar that has much less whip, you're using weights that are closer to the center, and so you don't get a whole lot of shaking. You notice just as Eric unracks the bar, you see him stabilizing in his midsection and core, back and forth, back and forth, because he's trying to slow that bar down, because the thing's just whipping yeah, yeah, like crazy. <laughs> it was. And he finally gets control of the thing, takes a big breath, drops down into the bottom, and of course when he hits the hole, the thing starts all over again, doing this. But he came up right out of the thing, so it was even more extraordinary to watch. And I've been following Eric and watching his videos over and over again to learn good technique for at least a couple of years now, uh, because they're, they're just perfect with their form. You watch it, it's just a clinic to see, deadlifting, benching, squatting. 
everything they do is, has always been, been uh, based on perfect technique. That's the way Ernie raised them and taught them, and that's the way they've become so successful. I, I knew I was doing something good if I was invited to squat in the cage, and that's, that's been a goal of mine for about three or four years, and it's something that I always told everybody that I would do, and it's something that's faced a lot of scrutiny. I, not too many people believe me when I said I'd be squatting in the cage someday. I will be squatting at least uh, 1,000 pounds on, on Sunday in the cage. I'm, I'm prepping for a powerlifting meet, uh, Relentless, the charity event. That is in three weeks. I'm just going to treat it like a normal training day. I'm, I'm going to work up to weights I would work up to in the gym. So I'll probably work up to 1,000 pounds. If it feels good, just like if I was back in the gym, I would go up. So anywhere from 1,000 to 1,100 pounds, we'll see how I feel. Char charity has actually uh, changed my life. I've never wanted to be a lawyer, I've never wanted to be a doctor, I've never, there's no career that I've wanted to be, I've just kind of been lost. The only thing I've ever known is training. I've, that's the only thing I've ever been passionate about, the only thing I've ever really been good at. But there's really no monetary value to being a good power lifter, even a world class power lifter, there's really no monetary value to that. And when I got the opportunity to do charity work for Hope Kids, I'm with a man named Scott Nutter, a very good friend of mine, he's putting on a meet called Relentless. It's a charity event for Hope Kids, which is a lot like Make-A-Wish Foundation. And they work with terminally ill kids or kids facing life-threatening illnesses. Through Relentless, I'm able to take my skills and my, my passion and actually use it to uh, raise money and benefit you know, people who you know, really don't have any, don't have any hope. You know. And it's, it's given my life purpose because I can take my perceived useless you know, talents and give it purpose. I can, you know, I, I can use what I'm passionate about to help other people. found the people who are associated with animal actually uh, they actually live the lifestyle that they portray on the outside. They're very dedicated, humble people. There's very little ego in the cage, which was a very pleasant surprise to me. Well, you know, Universal, one of the best things about them is they take a lot of, a lot of care in choosing who they bring on board. So, you know, it, you could be one of the best in the sport and if you have a bad reputation or they hear something about you that they don't like, you know, this guy's not nice to his fans or this guy's a bad attitude or he's not approachable or he's just, he's not, you know, he's not the kind of person we want associated with our company. They're not gonna bring him on. It's definitely different because we kind of have a brotherhood. I mean, everybody in the cage that you see here at the Arnold, uh, comes together, we meet every year. Um, we all come from different aspects of life. Um, I mean, we have power lifters, we have bodybuilders, we have just everyday Joe lifters that come out and we all can meet together and come for a, a common, common thing just to meet and to talk about training, talk about what we love. Any animal athlete can tell you that obviously they love the sport of bodybuilding, but more they just love the training of it.
So even though at the cage in Animal we have some of the guys who are the very best at what they do, we try to remove that pedestal. We pull that pedestal out, we break down the walls. One of the reasons that po that's possible is because we choose certain kinds of guys to be involved in what we do. Their excellence, their achievement in the sport, their winning contests or whatever, isn't the most important thing always. A lot of the time it's about, do you carry yourself with honor and dignity? Are you a good person? Are you good with people? Um, are you humble? Are you honest? Are you decent? And then, do you represent the sport in a way that's positive? Can you be a role model for kids or, or grown-ups even who aspire to be like you or simply aspire to get better? That's more important to us than, than the trophies that you've accumulated over the years.